Wednesday, episode number 52. If you're new here, Whip Wednesday is basically a day where I come on live every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, and I share something with you, some type of a demo, a technique, a skill, something like that, having to do with my crafts. And the Whip part of Wednesday is WIP, and that stands for work in progress. So it's something that I'm working on typically. And then I share some tips, some tricks with you, feature new products and stuff like that. So today we are going to be making this super cute little fabric basket. It holds quite a bit and the dimensions of the finished dimensions are roughly five inches by four inches by three and a half inches tall. So you can see, I probably have what? two, four, six, eight, ten, over 10 spools of thread and there's still room for more. Thank you, love. Gotta have some water over here. Let me put this here. All right, so this is what we're gonna be making today. I know how much y'all love these quickie little small kind of gift items and so I have done so many tutorials on little fabric baskets like this, snap ones, round ones, square ones, rectangular ones. So I thought, why not? Let's make another one. Holidays are coming up and we're always looking for new little organizational things and quick little gifts that are great stash busters, okay? So let's pop in real quick, say hi to some friends. We got some people tuning in from Hawaii. It's in morning time in Hawaii, awesome. And then Diane, hey, she's tuning in from New York. Hey, Marilyn, tuning in from Melbourne, Florida. That's a neighbor. I live, and I'm coming to y'all every Wednesday here from my home sewing studio, and we live in North Central Florida where the weather is beautiful. <laughs> it's been nice and dry and in the 40s in the mornings and at night, it's really, really nice weather for us here. Okay, hi, Gisela, tuning in from Sweden. That is amazing. Jan from Palm Harbor, another Florida friend. Hi, Pamela, tuning in from Louisiana. My husband's from New Orleans. Cool, cool. Uh, awesome. Joan says, I have made a lot of your little baskets. I love them. Well, here you go, Miss Joan. You're going to have just another one that you can whip up too. So let's jump right into it. We're starting off and you might want to take notes because I don't have a separate tutorial for this. This is going to be the demo, the tutorial. When I get some time, hopefully uh, later this month or something, I can make like a standalone tutorial for y'all. Let's go ahead and give them this over the shoulder shot. I'm starting off with two rectangular pieces of fabric and you know you can choose one for the exterior one for the lining you can see the pieces aren't that big the measurements take notes are 10 inches by 11 and a half so a little bit bigger than a 10 inch by 10 inch square piece of fabric and I just did that because I kind of like a slightly more rectangular shape to this but again once you know how to make it in this size with the dimensions I'm giving you feel free to play around with the dimensions and make it your own based on what you have okay Okay, Aisha Day says, hi, your eyebrows are snatched. Thank you, girl. <laughs> I try. Um, I found a new girl to do my eyebrows and they're on point. So yes, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, hi, Yvonne tuning in from Jamaica. Awesome. Hi, Kay from Jacksonville. Okay, y'all, here we go. So we're starting off with two rectangles of just quilting cotton fabrics. Dimensions are, again, 10 inches by 11 and a half, and I've cut them both to the same size. I'm going to be using this for my exterior and this for the lining. Now, as far as fabrics, that's all you need. The, the, the sweet spot of this little fabric basket is going to be the inside, what is giving it that shape, okay? Let me dump these guys out. So you can see that it stands alone. You don't need to have anything in it. And y'all probably already know what's in here, okay? One of my most favoriteest, favoriteest products. I've been using this stuff for, whoo, what, seven years at least. This is Bozal Inner Form, and I am using the white sew-in version. This is not the fusible kind. It also comes in a single-sided fusible as well as a double-sided fusible, but I'm gonna be using the sew-in version, which I find over time, I have found that, you know, sometimes when you use fus fusible products in general, it's like if you're flipping the bag right side out or maybe if you have to wash it or you use it a lot, you'll start to find over time sometimes the fabric peels away from the uh, from the fusible side of the interfacing. So back in the days when I was using the fusible type, I would constantly find that I had to keep steaming and pressing my projects to kind of re-adhere them and smooth out those wrinkles. So I decided to just use the sew-in version and you'll find that it works out really great. This is what I used here too. And I barely gave this a press. Okay, so let's see, two four, six, eight, 10, and 11 spools of thread. And these are good chunky sized ones. And you can see I still have room in there for more. So if you're looking for little 
drawer organizers or little cubby things that you need to organize different things in your sewing room or just in your home. These make great little gifts. All right. So we are using the Bozal Interform and we do have it in stock. Okay. This package is 18 inches by 58 inches. So half a yard by 58 inches wide. We're going to be using one piece that measures 10 and a half by, uh, excuse me, 10 inches by 11 and a half, the same dimensions that we cut our fabrics to. And so you can see that you'll be able to crank out quite a few of these if you get one pack of this. Now the link for this is in the chat box. It's in the video description box below if you're watching us on YouTube as well. And I do believe we have some in stock that are twice the width of this. So instead of 18 inches, it's 36. So a full yard this way lengthwise, and then the width of it is 58 inches. So we carry both of these cut sizes in stock. So let's start. Let's um, share with you some way. Hi, Starlin, tuning in from New Orleans. That's your people right there, Brandon. Um, when you get it out of the package, it's going to be folded, right? The 18 inches this way. I've obviously already been using from here, but I want to share with you something that I used to get a lot of uh, questions and emails about. Like when it comes out of the package, how do you get rid of these wrinkles that appear here? I've shared this tip several times, but I always like to share it again and again because I know there's some of you that maybe are just tuning in and maybe have never worked with this product before. I'm going to share with you some really great tips, both for prepping it and sewing with it. So hopefully if you've never tried it, you'll click the link in the chat box or the description box below and you can purchase a pack from us and give it a try. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see Monique. Hi, Miss Monique. She says, I use one of your little fabric baskets to make a, a basket that she uses to hold her wonder clips. In, and she says it holds up really well. This foam stabilizer is great for bags. Anything that's like a shape, uh, that you want to create, whether it's round, rectangular, or square, but that you want it to hold stuff in, like a purse, a handbag, uh, project bags, and that kind of stuff, it works great for that. So again, a great scrap buster because we're not using much. So to get rid of these wrinkles, and I think you can see that pretty good. So once I hover this over it, you'll see. I have water in my iron, and I'm activating the steam, okay? I'm not pressing the foam with the iron, although you can lightly. I'm just going to be hovering it over. So I'm steaming it in the areas where I see wrinkles. And it literally just like puffs right back to life because it's foam. The inside foamy squishy part that gives everything like that cushiony feel, it pops back out. But because it's package folded, it's being held and compressed in that shape. So when you get it out, you got to freshen it up and hit it with some steam so that then when you go on to stitching on it or using your fabric with it, whether or not it's fusible, all that, you want it to be one level height across, okay, for the thickness of the foam. And I'm just going to work in this little corner here because I don't need much, okay? One little rectangle is all I need. Ta-da! So there it is. So now we're going to cut ourselves a rectangle 10 inches by 11 and a half. I'm just going to use a bigger ruler. Let me subcut this down to 11. Let's go 12, and that way I can work with a smaller piece to cut from. Just a rough cut here. All right, now let's cut this baby down. I'm going 10 inches this way. And then we're going to go zoom out. Like that? Or what? Okay. 10 inches this way. And then I'm going to go 11 and a half the other way. This way. 11 and a half. Okay. So there's the piece I need. 10 by 11 and a half. Okay. I'm going to take my exterior fabric. I'm going to place it on top. Now, remember, this is not a fusible product. So if you wanted to use like a spray based, uh, I like to use Sulky KK2000 is a really great product. And some people I know use what, like, a, what is it called? 505 or something. If you wanted to spritz that, obviously make sure you're in a well ventilated area. Give it a little spritz just to help hold it down. I'm not even going to bother with that because what I'm going to do, and you can quilt this uh, and, and come up with your own way of how you want the stitching design to be. The key is I want to hold these two layers together. Now, keep in mind, if you're planning to do like cross hatching or free motion quilting, what I would do is start off with pieces that are slightly bigger, then quilt just those two layers, the fabric to the foam stabilizer, and then trim it down to the 10 inches by 11 and a half. And the reason I say that is that 
it shrinks down as you quilt it and stitch it, and the more densely quilted the panel is, the more it's gonna shrink down. In other words, if you cut it down to the finish size you need, like I have here, and then you quilt it, it's going to shrink further from there, okay? So whenever you do anything like that, make sure you start off with a bigger piece, and then after it's done and quilted, then uh, trim it down, okay? Awesome, thanks Heather. She says, don't forget to give the video a like for Vanessa. I appreciate that. Here's what we're gonna do. You can draw the line. I'm gonna use chalk, because I think that'll show up good on camera. Where's my chalk liner? Does this happen to y'all where you have like seven of the same notion and then whenever you need it, you still can't find it? Surprise! All right, got it. Here we go. So this is a slightly darker fabric. So I have this oriented with the 11 and a half inch dimension going vertically in front of me, okay? From this side, I'm gonna measure over three inches and I'm just gonna draw a line. Slide it up, finish the line towards the top. Perfect. I'm just going to flip it over, do the same thing. Three inches over from this side. And remember, this fabric is not adhered to this at all. It's basically just sitting on top of the foam, which is fine because after I do these lines, I'm going to stitch on these lines. And that's just going to give me some light quilting, but enough to kind of help these layers stay together like that. Okay, you can always come in and do lines across this way or you can do more lines that way. But since I cut it already down to size, I don't want to add too much more stitching because then I run the risk of shrinking it beyond the dimensions that I need. Hey, that guy from Texas, I appreciate the super chat, thanks. All right, so my Juki LB5020 sewing machine here, y'all know this thing is a workhorse. We did get some back in stock. I don't think we have very many left, but if you've been waiting for months, to order one of these, we have them in the shop. So you can always shop with us for the products that we carry at uh, craftygemini.com slash shop, all right? So now I have my needle set into the center position on my presser foot, and I'm gonna follow the white chalk line with my stitches. I'm gonna lengthen my stitch length to about three millimeters, 3.5. If your machine struggles going through the bulk, even though the foam is chunky, but it compresses because it's so airy, right? It's foam. You may consider increasing the stitch length just a hair. Three millimeters is plenty for me. And then, because this is not like fused or adhered in any way, what I'm gonna make sure I do is swoop the fabric kind of like this out to the side to keep it nice and smooth. You don't want the fabric to bubble up on you because then if you stitch over a bubble like that, you're gonna end up setting a pucker in your finished project and we don't want that, right? So I'm just smoothing it through. Now some sewing machines will require you to do this uh, with a walking foot because it won't be able to take the bulk. I always have to kind of give those types of disclaimers because not every make and model of sewing machine is created equally. And y'all know on my jukies, I don't even have a walking foot for this machine. And I've been making bags that feature all kinds of stuff, including faux leather and cork and all that. You just gotta be familiar with what your machine requires, you know, for the different projects. All right, so I'm gonna cut my threads. Now for this, I know some people will ask, the size needle. I can typically on any of my Jukis use an 8012 universal needle, fine. I have a 9014 needle in this machine because I was using it to make another handbag earlier this week, okay? So somewhere in that range would be good. If your machine is like breaking needles or it just can't handle the bulk, consider going slowly and bumping up the sewing machine needle size and see if that helps. So I'm just stitching down the other line as well, same way. Just keeping it nice and smooth. And then the thread, you can use cotton thread if that's all you have in your stash. I always like to use polyester thread whenever I'm making a bag, a pouch, a basket, something that's going to hold weight. Just because the polyester is a synthetic fiber, so it's, it tends to be stronger than a natural fiber like a cotton, okay? So those are just like rule, you know, rule of the thumb. Okay, so I have two lines of stitching right here that are holding the fabric on top of the phone, but look, we have all this that's still loose. So I'm gonna go back now and baste stitch all around the four sides of my rectangle with an even longer stitch length. And let me plug up my power cord. I pulled it out by mistake. All right, so for this, this is outside basting. This is just, uh, it's not a construction stitch. This is not a seam from the project. I just wanna hold this down. So I'm gonna go nice and long on the stitch length. You can see that they're good. I'm going, say, 
just a basting stitch. And again, you want to make sure that you're smoothing it to the outside because if you bubble up the fabric to the center and stitch it down, there is no way to get rid of this excess fabric there. If you've stitched it to the outside of it, it's going to hold all that in. So instead, smooth out and then stitch down so you don't have that on the inside of the actual project, all right? Now, the needle position, I'm going to scoot it all the way to the outer edge here close to this side so when i use the side of my presser foot as my guide i'm going to be at an eighth of an inch in to my project and that's exactly where you want to be okay let's see um oh i see janelle is saying would look cute with the stitch and steam so if you were going to use stitch and steam for this project i would start off with a larger panel you know, do your stitching like we've done before on the stitch and steam. Now, for those that don't know, stitch and steam is that fabric that wrinkles up on itself. So I would, Janelle, shrink that fabric up first and make sure that it ends up being larger than the 10 inch by 11 and a half inch size and then trim it to that size and then baste it to your foam, right? Because the foam is too thick to try and shrink that up with stitch and steam. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so we're going an eighth of an inch in from the outer edge. You can go nice and slow so that you can smooth that fabric out. Just like that. I'm going to stop with the needle down on the corner and pivot. Whoop, I went off the edge, no big deal. Put it right back, smooth this out. You do want to catch the foam and the fabric on this outer edge. That's the whole point of the basting, right? I don't want any of that fabric to lift up on me. And what this does from quilting in the center, right, as we smooth everything out, and then anchoring the outside edges, the fabric is really, it has nowhere to go. So we shouldn't have any bubbles or puckers or anything else. And of course, I only did two lines, two vertical lines of quilting. You can do more if you want more areas of the fabric to kind of be held down with the quilting. Okay. Last little area, and I'm peeking it up my bob and make sure I don't run out. <laughs> Didn't that happen to me last time? I think it was a different colored thread. All right. And then I just go over those first couple stitches by a few. There's no need to back stitch or nothing. All this stitching we just did, the base stitching, is going to get hidden in the seams, okay? So here's what we're working with. Ta-da! All right, so now let's see. Yes, garnet. That is the clarification on the stitch and steam. Do it before you attach it to the foam. Absolutely. Okay, so now we're going to turn it on its side. So now the 11 and a half inch measurement is going this way horizontally. I'm going to grab, and I keep feeling something, and it's a hair from my ponytail. Look how long my hair is, y'all. <laughs> I blow dried it. That's why it looks like that. All right, so I'm going to take my Crafty Gemini ruler, and for those that don't know, this is one of my rulers. You can't see it because it's clear, but it measures 5 inches by 10, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I have this 11 and a half inch measurement going this way. The 10 inch dimension should be going here. I'm going to fold it in half. I want to find the center on the bottom and the top here along the long dimension, the 11 and a half inch. So I'm going to fold this in half. You can also just do the math if you wanted to. And then I'm pinching, make sure this is here. I'm pinching at the center marks here. Let's go ahead and mark it with a little chalk so I can see. Okay, then that center mark, and hopefully y'all can see that, but I can see it, so. I'm gonna take the five inch edge of my ruler, okay? Half of five is two and a half, right? So we're going to place the two, I see one, two, three, four, and then the edge of the ruler is five. So at the two and a half inch mark here, I'm placing the two and a half inch line on my ruler on the center line. What does that do? Like this. I'm going to zoom in. Apologies for the glare. Let me see if I can scoot this over. Better there, maybe. So two and a half inch. 
maybe that's better. Okay, so two and a half inches here, I put it on the white chalk line. And then I'm gonna slide it up, okay, so that the bottom edge of the fabric panel here is at the two inch mark. So because this is a 10 inch ruler, this is one inch, this is two inch at eight, okay? So centered at two and a half, right there, and then up two inches. So what does that give me? That gives me a rectangle that's exactly underneath my ruler here. It's centered on the side panel and the box itself, right? The area that's underneath my ruler measures two inches by five, the full width of the fabric, right? So then I'm gonna trace around this. And if you're using a lighter fabric, one of these like blue or purple fabric markers works really well. Since I have this darker fabric, I'm gonna use the chalk so hopefully y'all can see it a little better. So that's the little box, okay? We're gonna stitch on that line in a minute, but I'm gonna flip it over and do the same thing to the opposite side. So two and a half inch on the white chalk line and slide it up two inches. So two inches by five. Looks good and then I'm gonna trace this edge here. It's basically a two inch by five inch rectangle that's centered on the long dimension, on the two long dimension sides of your panel, okay? Now we're gonna stitch just to the outside of that line because where the line is that I marked with the chalk, I want that to be cut out, okay? So my stitching, I'm gonna stitch like right here, say an eighth of an inch behind that line into the main panel of my fabric. Okay, and for this, I want to shorten my stitch length. I'm going to put the needle back in the center position because since I'm kind of following where the chalk line is, I can just scoot it a hair over. And then I'm going to do 2.4, okay, on the lines of stitching. So I'm going to stay right here, start outside, pivot just beyond the line, and go around. Make sure that you stop with the needle down. So my bat, my uh, sewing machine automatically stops with the needle up and I'm gonna sink the needle in. Lift the presser foot, that way I don't lose my spot and I can just pivot. And if you find that your fabric is bubbling up a lot, you can lengthen the stitch length too. Since I didn't do that much quilting, you may find, you know, it's cotton fabric, it's a pretty loose weave, even on the high quality cottons. Uh, it, it will move on you a little bit because you have a lot of bulk. So if you feel like it's moving too much on you to where you think it's going to affect your project, just feel free to lengthen the stitch length. And what that does is it allows the machine to pull through more of the fabric before it takes the next stitch and that can help ease that a little bit, okay? All right, how many of y'all are gonna make this? Remember that the foam stabilizer, we sell it in our online shop. You can order it in a half yard uh, length by 58 inches, and then you can also get it in the one yard. And if you're planning to crank out some holiday gifts, this little basket I think would be perfect. It's another great little project because it doesn't have to be super duper perfect. You can be a little off here and there, here and there, and you'll still get a super cute basket that's totally usable. All right, so trim my thread. So I stitch just to the outside of both of those lines. I'm going to grab my 18 millimeter or 28 millimeter, excuse me, rotary cutter, just because it's a little bit smaller. You know, typically we use this one, especially when I'm cutting bigger things. The 28 millimeter is great for this. Key here is when I cut on the line, now I'm cutting on the chalk line. So I'm cutting to the inside of where I stitch. The stitching is going to serve as basically the same thing that we did on the outside perimeter of the rectangle, which was the basting stitch. So after I cut this part out, those edges where they would normally lift up, right? They're already secured in place, if that makes sense. So I'm going to carefully cut on my chalk line. And here you don't want to keep going through because the chances are really high that you'll cut into your stitches. So I stop just shy of that top line. Then I'll come here across, cut. And then I likely have the little corner still attached. That one I got good. And here, then I just come in with scissors and finish snipping it out. Okay, we'll do the same thing to the other side. Awesome, Paula says she wants to make when she plans to make it a little bit bigger for her fat quarters. If you work out the dimensions for that, Paula, let us know. 
because that would be amazing. Oh, look at that. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. I just blanked. I was like, now what do I do? No. Let's grab. <laughs> Next up is the lining fabric. So you see how that's all stitched? And I don't have to worry about this coming up because we stitched it before we trimmed it. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and use this as a template to cut out the lining fabric. So you can just flip it like this if you want. And I need to do the same thing and trim away this area. So because the foam is thick, it's almost like I'm using an acrylic template or a ruler on top because the height of the foam is now like the buffer next to the side blade of my rotary cutter and I can use it as a template instead of having to go in and measure and mark and then cut again. So if you know me and you've signed up for my classes or done a lot of projects with me, you know I love to use one piece that's been pre-cut accurately as a template for the next step. So here and here, we'll just trim away the threads on the corner. Keep it together, next side. Remember, don't cut into your stitches. Just keep that rotary cutter blade from rolling past. I'd rather you have a couple threads there that you can just snip with the tip of your thread snips than have you cut into your stitches and then have to restitch the line. Okay, so now we have these two pieces. It's assembly time, y'all. This is a quick project once you get it down. And if you start doing it like assembly line style, I feel like I'm gonna see a picture of somebody posting maybe like 12 of these together as a full set of stuff. Imagine if you're into like, um, this is something that I would use for like uh, soap making, candle making, if you make body bars and stuff like that, you can fill the little basket with some gifts, right? And then wrap it, put a little thing on top. And there you go. They can always keep the basket instead of just dumping it and throwing it away like if it was paper or plastic or something. And then they can use it as a little organizing basket in their own homes. All right, so first step, when you have this piece, I'm gonna zoom out just a hair. And I think the kids are back, Brian. All right, my kids are out riding bikes, so they're back. I'm like, are they back yet? They're taking so long. No, nope, they're back. Both are alive and both of their bicycles look intact. Parenting win! <laughs> oh. You know how here's rural roads, boy. You got to be careful. Okay, so here's uh, the exterior. This is the first one we're going to stitch up. What we're going to do is fold it onto itself like this, almost like a little letter T, like a capital letter T, this shape. And the first seam you're going to sew is this one right here. Don't worry about this area just yet. I'm going to use a quarter of an inch seam allowance here. Okay, and I'm gonna back stitch at the beginning and at the ends. Now, this is a construction seam, and y'all know I love to say when it's a construction seam, shorten the stitch length. But we also need to take into account that it is all this bulk. It is foam, so even if your machine has a tough time going through like layers and layers of cork fabric and faux leather, those are thicker. This is thick itself, but it's super airy because it's foam, so don't worry too much about that. Most machines I've ever used, have easily been able to sew at least through two layers of foam like that. So move my needle over and I'm gonna shorten my stitch length, but because it is a little bit bulky, if you shorten your, your stitch length to say two millimeters and you see that it's like staying in the same spot, stitching and stitching, lengthen it a little, then lengthen it a little until you find that it's feeding through smoothly, okay? And again, the machine is a workhorse. This is like nothing and I'm gonna backstitch at the end. Okay. All right, other side. So notice, I just stitched this one. I'm gonna flip it and do the other side here. Same thing. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Next, this area that we cut out is going to come like this. Open it and make that side seam match up here where the fold is. So we're gonna go like this and like this. And because it was cut out before we sewed the side seam and ate up some in the seam allowance here, you're gonna find this, okay? Where it's like it doesn't align. It's not going to, right? Because this seam, you ate up double this amount already. So that's like the width that eats up from there. So what I do is I just bring this seam and make it touch down here. Boom. It's 
So it's almost like a little bow. Okay, so you have it further up here and further up here. It's not a big deal. Just pull it down and sew yourself like a three-eighths of an inch seam allowance. The most important thing here is that when you start sewing, don't think, oh, I have to stick to the quarter inch and then end up sewing down here. You're gonna miss this whole area and you'll end up with a hole in your basket. You don't want that, right? So whatever seam allowance is right here at this stitch line, that's what you're gonna ride all the way across. And you do the same thing to the opposite side, okay? So again, Keep that stitch length nice and short if you can. If not, increase it if you need to. And really, as I'm looking at it, it's a quarter of an inch in most of the areas. It's just at the outermost areas. It's like a chunky quarter of an inch. So that's no big deal. Now here, when you get to this bulky seam, you can press it open, you can press it to the side, whatever you feel like your machine is gonna be able to handle. I don't even bother with it. If it goes one way, it goes, and I just stitch right over it. Because on this machine, I don't have an issue. Okay, and then I'm going to back stitch, and that side is done. Yes, Joan says, good tip on lengthening your stitch as her machine gets caught up in the corners. Absolutely, and these are things that people are like, well, I'm following the seam allowance, but it's not like a hard and fast black and white rule. This is the seam allowance. It must be this the whole way, right? You have to do what you got to do to get the end result that's necessary to successfully complete the project but still you're working with your machine. So you gotta understand your machine. And the only way to understand your machine is to use it, right? And try a variety of projects on it. So same thing here, I'm bringing this up to match up with the raw edge. Make sure that it's centered too. You don't wanna be like pulling it too far over one side or the other, okay? It's like a little bow tie there, or a little bow. So same thing on this side, back stitch at the beginning and end. Now, I don't trim away the seam allowance at those corners, like this part, I just leave it. For a little basket like that, you usually wanna leave some type of bulk in the seam, like in the seam allowance, so that it creates that shape. And because this area is on the bottom, I want it to be able, I mean, it will because it's foam, but I do absolutely want it to be able to stand on its own, okay? So that little bit, there, I'm not gonna trim that. For what, you know, because it's uneven on the ends and if you try to cut it flush, then you're gonna make the seam allowance uneven. I'd rather leave it like that. So now you can imagine that the next steps are to do those same things that we just did on the exterior to the lining. Easy peasy and a whole lot less bulk. So I'm folding it in half. And now if you're in my bag club or you've taken my bag classes before, you know I always say it's a great tip to increase your seam allowances in the lining. However, this is not the project where you wanna do that. The reason being that some of that excess lining gets eaten up here. Can you see how the lining, that blue polka dotted fabric is what is also trimming out the top? This is not binding, y'all. This is just the stiffness and the bulk of uh, the foam stabilizer pushes up. So instead of forcing the fabric down in, and then top stitching so that there's only exterior fabric on the outside, I let it, I let the foam stabilizer lift up the lining a little bit so it sits higher up inside the finished basket. So throw all that that I've said before because this project, if you are letting the lining come out like this to trim out the top of your basket, you don't want it so bigger because then it'll be super short on the inside, okay? So this is the lining, so I'm going to, not that, um, quarter inch seam allowance and then stitch length, I'll do a 2.2, that's fine. So I'm gonna back stitch at the beginning and ends and because this is just fabric, you can go nice and small on your, on your uh, stitch length, right? So two millimeters to 2.5, something like that is good. Yes, Mary Grace says she's gonna make a template from the thin cardboard to make the cutting easier and that way you won't have to measure more than once. Genius. If you're gonna be making these as gifts, like assembly line style, totally. You can just put a template on, do, 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 cut around, and just cut out a bunch of pieces. If you have a big fabric stash, what I would probably do is just cut up a ton of fabric scraps into that general shape, right? Because the exterior piece and the lining piece 
are identical. So you can just cut a ton, and then once you have a nice big stack of the fabrics, then pick, oh, this is the exterior, um, and then look through the rest of the fabrics and say, this will be a cute lining, and then go in and pair them up. That way you don't have to spend too much time picking out fabrics. Once they're already cut to the template you need, you know you can just grab them and go. Okay, so we did that. Now we're gonna do the bottom by boxing out these edges. Now you may be wondering, oh no, Vanessa, don't you plan on leaving a hole in the lining somewhere to flip this out? And the answer is no. This is one of those few projects where I will actually leave the opening when we construct the lining and the exterior. Because of the bulk of the foam, it actually almost helps us tuck under the raw edges. So you'll see how that works in a minute. So Carla says, quarter inch seams, I always mess this up. Does your needle align to the left, right, or middle? So if a quarter inch seam, I feel like for quilters we default to a quarter inch seam allowance, but if a quarter inch seam seems really narrow for you, you can go like three eighths of an inch. And I would say most home sewing machines, like computerized, just basic home sewing machines, most of them, if they're designed for garment sewing, tend to be or tend to default to three eighths of an inch when the needle is in the center. So if you can move the needle position away from the center on your machine, then I scoop mine a little over to the right to then make it so that the edge of the foot to the needle is that quarter of an inch. And that way I don't have to put on a separate foot. I don't have to use a seam guide. I can just use the edge of my presser foot, okay? So we're gonna do the same thing here, bring this in. And that seam, I'm not even going to bother to open it because it's only a quarter of an inch. So same thing we've done before. And this one I find that because the fabric isn't stabilized to anything, it tends to be like a bigger seam allowance just on these bottom edges, which is fine. Let me see, did I move it? Nope, I caught that corner, so we're good there. Other side, and then we're just gonna put them together. Flip it out and see what we got. So make sure that this is centered though. And that is not centered. There, and pull up. I usually try to do things without needing pins or clips, but then I mess up sometimes. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, let's put these two together. Now here, you can trim away some of the excess there, but again, because it's it's not bulky at all, right? There's no batting, there's no fleece, there's no nothing there. It's just gonna be on the inside. I don't really see a need for it. But okay, now we have two. Ta-da! So I like to leave the exterior one wrong side out like that, just because it's bulkier and I'm not trying to flip it out just yet. Then we're gonna flip our lining pretty side out. Okay, we haven't left an opening anywhere yet. Then I'm gonna place the lining inside of the exterior, pretty sides together, that is key, okay? Pretty side to pretty side, and this one's gonna turn out so cute. Then I'm gonna tuck in those bottom, uh, like the box corner seams on the bottom there, so I can see what I'm working with. Grab a couple of clips, because the next step is to clip around the top. That's where we're gonna sew next, then we'll flip it right side out, all that. So the side seams need to match. So I'm gonna place my side seam from the lining right with the side seam of the exterior, put a clip. It's not that bulky of a project, don't worry too much about like, are you pressing the seam open? Eh, you could do whatever you want. It's not a big deal here. That's why I like these, these are quickie little gifts. Do whatever you feel like doing in the moment and when the thing is done, nobody will know. So those are the two side seams that need to intersect or ideally they would intersect. I do those first where I place the clips and then I'll just keep pushing around here and place more clips 
just to make up you know the difference of where this needs to be and you'll see that because of the foam the lining wants to stick out a little bit just push it down because you should still remember they were cut to the same size so we want the dimensions to match up against the raw edges raw edge to raw edge in other words don't place a clip with the lining fabric sticking up above the foam like that I'd rather you dunk it down in there and then place a clip same thing on this side and now this is where we're going to leave an opening. I typically don't like to leave openings anywhere where I have an intersecting seam. It's just like extra drama there, right? You have more bulk, you have extra seams, some going in different directions, just avoid it. So instead, I'm going to leave an opening somewhere along the sides here where it's just like a smooth fabric edge. Now the opening for this I'm always a, a little hesitant to say like a set dimension because I feel like sometimes I go bigger on the opening that I leave for flipping things out. And then when I flip it out, I'm like, that was totally unnecessary. Now I have to hide this longer piece, right, of a hole. But then when I'm like, oh, you don't need much, let's just leave two inches. Then you have to struggle to flip the whole thing out. And then I'm like, oh, maybe that was a little, a little too little of an opening to leave. So let's say <laughs> three inches three inches. We'll see if we can get it out of there. Now, this needs to be sewn here and you can see that I can't quite get it here. If you have a sewing machine where you can remove the accessory bin and expose the free arm, which is narrower, feel free to do that like this, which is what I'm going to do. If you have a sewing machine that's put into a table so that this part of it is flat against the whole thing and you won't be able to drape anything over, then you'll probably want to flip this the other way, like flop it that way and then insert the presser foot like this to stitch it okay so i'm gonna do it like this because i can do that with the free arm so i'm gonna leave an opening i'm gonna say from here to here and this was what eh, four inches we'll do that between the two lines that we drew those initial quilting lines we're gonna leave that pretty much and then i'm gonna sew a quarter of an inch seam allowance again you can leave a short-ish stitch length. I'm going to leave mine at, uh, I'm going to go up to 2.4. Why not? And then let's start. So again, raw edges should be aligned with the right side edge of your presser foot. Remember to set your machine to stop with the needle down. That's always very helpful when you're moving stuff and have to like reposition things. Now here it's important to be consistent with the seam allowance because remember I said that that excess or the, the thickness of the bulk of the foam is what's going to allow us to trim out the top edge of the basket with the lining fabric. This is your seam allowance. So if you have a quarter of an inch in some areas and that has to do with this seam that I'm stitching right now and then you have half of an inch in another area, this trimmed out little top edge that looks like binding is going to be just as lumpy. Okay, it's going to look narrow here and bigger here because it has to do with how much foam you have there that's lifting up that lining fabric to make that binding, that faux binding look, okay? So try to be super consistent here so you get a nice finish. Ooh, there goes a the clip. Um, hi, Cheryl. She's just tuning in and she says, I'm wondering if these are layer cake pieces or can you use... Uh, layer cakes to make this basket. So the, the dimensions that I'm using here are slightly bigger. The rectangles of fabric we began with measure 10 inches by 11 and a half. So I'm sure you could make it out of 10 inch, but the dimensions may be slightly different. So it's just something, you know, that you'd have to figure out trial and error wise to see what size the rectangle, the rectangles that you cut out on the sides are and all that stuff. So if you want to make it just like mine and follow these dimen or these directions, you can use those dimensions. All right, so we're coming back around to the beginning. And instead of back stitching, I'm just going to go over those first couple of stitches by a few. That's plenty to secure. I just want to make sure I'm going right over them. Okay. And did I just go over the full opening? Are you kidding me? I'm not even thinking right now. Did we leave? Oh my gosh. Why didn't anybody stop me? Oh. You didn't tell me anything. Oh. Okay. Let's go back in here and leave an opening. 
I guess I started on the opening, but because I didn't mark it, I just kept going through. So anyways, we talked about leaving an opening here on this four inch chunk. So do not try and cut. This is actually great troubleshooting tips. Don't try to rip out stitches from the foam side because you'll start mistakenly picking away at that foam. I have made this mistake many times before years ago. So what I like to do is actually cut or pull stitches. If you do the same thing I did here from the cotton side, and this is my favorite way to pop stitches. And it's going to be a little tricky because I'm kind of far from it. And it is a, a beige colored thread. So I am just going to pop every fourth or fifth stitch in that space. Let me see if I can do it a little down here. Thankfully, I have great vision. Okay. So I'm going to pop a couple more and you'll see. If you do this where you forget to leave an opening... You will, even after popping these stitches, you'll need to secure the stitches on either end because remember, I just popped out stitches here. Let me do a couple more. And then I'm going to go to the back side from the foam side and carefully, I literally stitched all the way around and was like, wait, what? That was easy. <laughs> okay, so I pulled out stitches in this area. Now I'm going to come to the foam side carefully and just lift on the thread. This is the seam. Is it this one? Okay. So once I lift it, because it's cut on this side, this will pull out pretty easily. Okay. And I will just pull that out and see, is that the hole that I want? And it is. So that allows me to not be picking at the foam and kind of messing with the thickness of it, right? Because it's so light and airy on the inside. You don't want to mess with it. So I only use a seam ripper on the side of the foam to lift that thread up after I've already popped the stitches on the back side. But now what happens? If I just keep pulling, I can just take the whole thing out. I don't want that, right? So I need to come to wherever the end of that opening is going to end up or where I want it to end. And I'm just going to go over those stitches with a few back stitches to secure it in place there and secure it in place on the opposite end. And then I'll have the proper opening. Okay. Oh, yes. I see some of y'all like the seam ripper is my best friend. Uh, Mary Grace says, I hate when I close up the hole. It happens to all of us. What are we going to do? So here is one end of it. I'm going to take a few stitches into my line, back stitch, and that should be good. Just remember, like when you have to anchor those down, don't think that you can just take two stitches and it's plenty. If you're on the same seam line, just stitch a, like an inch or so, you know, stitch a little back stitch and then stitch like an inch into the original stitch line so that that can be nice and anchored like that. Good. And then we'll come over to the other end and do the same thing here just to anchor that thing into place. Nobody told me. I can't believe it. Okay. Now we have our opening and it's plenty big. I think we're going to reach in here. And one quick tip, remember how I just said, make sure that your seam allowance in this area is nice and even. If you sew it and you see that it's not even, this would be the time to trim things up to make it even. Because again, once we flip this out and see this opening was too big. Like I really didn't need all this room. It always happens. It's so hard to gauge. <laughs> it's either too big or way too tight. <laughs> okay, so here's my opening. I'm going to reach in through the opening, so in between my layers, and poke out those box corners on the exterior first, because that's the outer base of the project. Okay. Ta-da! Now, I'm going to next is to, let me cut this tail, is push the lining into the basket. Okay. So do you see how the height, oh, that looks so cute. The height of the foam is making that lining stick up. If you don't want this kind of trimmed up edge here, that looks like a full binding, you can, right, pull on the lining, fold that seam allowance to the inside completely and then top stitch it in place. So you can do that too. Only thing is it's going to be quite bulkier when you do the top stitching around here. And then, you know, your lining may be a little bit baggier than you would like, but that still looks cute. I do like that trimmed up edge. So we're going to leave it like that. Now where the opening is and see this, I left the opening 
beyond one of these stitch lines, but no big deal. See what happens? Look, there's the opening. When you tug on it, do you see how that just flips onto itself? It's a dream. It's probably one of the easiest openings to just like close up and stitch up without having to constantly be like tucking or gluing or whatever underneath there. Okay. So I'm just going to top stitch then around the entire perimeter. But one thing I like to do before, and it's not necessary, but you may find that it helps, is to give this a press. And I'm just going to use this garment sewing board thing that I bought years ago. I don't even know from where. But it's a sleeve board, so I'm just going to use it because I can drape this over and kind of press. So if you find that your stuff is like a little bit off here, you, if you have a tool like this, you can set it on top and that way you can press it. If you have a tailor's clapper, let me grab mine. That can help you kind of set those seams in place, especially if you want to give it that nice crisp edge to these lines, like to the stitching or yeah, to the stitching, like the shape of the box. I mean, And I'm just pushing the lining to the inside so that the only amount of lining I have sticking out is just enough to kind of cover that, that top binding edge. I keep calling it binding. Faux binding. Oh, Trisha says that they were all yelling at their computers, were they? <laughs> no opening, you forgot to leave it open. That's okay. There's always, it happens to everybody. And that was a great little learning tip, I think, too, to help you troubleshoot it. Because sometimes if you're a beginner and that happens, you think it's only you. Like, oh, no, I can't believe I forgot. And then sometimes you don't know how to go back and fix it. So I'm glad that I got to share that with y'all. And it's not the end of the world. It's like literally takes an extra minute to fix. No big deal. Okay. Super cute. Let's go ahead and top stitch this. Now for top stitching, we are sewing through a little bit more bulk. Have fluff everywhere. I was spinning yarn this morning. Okay, I am going to lengthen it, right? We're going through bulk and it's a top stitch. If you're using a pop of color, oh, this is where, oh my gosh, it looks so good. I was like, why is that lifting up? That's where the opening is, but look how perfectly pressed under that is. Oh, a dream. And y'all know what I'm talking about. If you've made projects where you have some bulk with foam or fleece and you have to tuck it under, it's like, oh, no matter how good you try to make it, like you can still tell that that's where the hole was. Nobody will know. Okay, nobody will know. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, that's from a TikTok video. We're like, they're gonna know. Nobody's gonna know. Okay, uh, we're lengthening our stitch length three to three point five. Again, if your machine is struggling with bulk, go a little bit longer. Three, three point five is fine. I'm again going to remove the little accessory bin and then expose the free arm so I can just drape this over and scoop my project in. Now for this. You will need to decide, am I going to use a set quarter of an inch seam allowance? Am I going to do three eighths? Or you can just eyeball it as you go if your uh, top edge here is not that consistent. Now, I do not recommend stitching in the ditch, and I will just say that right now. Everybody thinks stitching in the ditch is so easy. I'm going to go so basic. I'm just going to stitch in the ditch. Stitching in the ditch is not easy. <laughs> because if you're stitching in the ditch just fine and you take one stitch over this way into the exterior fabric or over this way into the lining fabric, you're going to see it and it looks not neat. Let's just say that. So I don't recommend you stitch in the ditch. I prefer you stitch here just above the seam line. Okay. Again, I don't know who's, who, 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 um, spread that lie, but stitching in the ditch is not easy. I don't know why. Like a lot of beginners will be like, well, I'm just going to keep it simple and stitch in the ditch. I'm like, girl, that's not beginner. Okay. Stitch length is set to three on mine, and I have my needle set in the same position I use for quarter of an inch seam allowance. Me, oops, sorry for the screech. There. Okay, so y'all can see. I'm gonna start here, and actually, you know what? I like to start just over, like before the opening, okay? And the reason for that is, if I start past the opening here, we're working with a cotton fabric that was just by itself. It wasn't interfaced. So you know what's going to happen, right? As you work your way around and you start to come here, you may have moved a couple of millimeters of fabric. And then what happens? You get to the opening and you're stitching it. And because this is loose and open, you end up stitching a pucker in place. Has that happened to you? 
It probably has if you like to make these types of projects. So instead, anchor that opening down at the first start of this. So I'm going to start here and right there go into closing up that opening, if that makes sense. And you can also put clips here. Like if you find that that lining is, is lifting up or getting in your way or whatever, feel free to do this. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like the fabric will move on you. So this is how to avoid that. Start there first. And if you see that the fabric is getting stretched out as you're going around the top opening, lengthen the stitch length. Give that, give the feed dogs a little bit more room in that length of the stitch to pull more fabric through instead of like being tiny stitches. It's going to keep scooting, scooting, scooting the fabric up and stretching it or distorting it for you, okay? Cheryl says, I agree, stitching the ditch is hard. Girl, it's hard. <laughs> I'm like, why? Why would they tell you stitch in the ditch? It ain't easy because it has to do with what side the seam was pressed to. So one side is going to be like the depressed side and the other one is high up. So if you don't hit it on the same side that the seam line is depressed or pushed down, right? And you bump up to the bulkier side. Oh my gosh, that thing sticks out like, woo. Like you could tell you didn't do it right. And that's not, you know, we want to avoid those things. Especially when you're first starting off, you want to do things that blend a little bit easier. You don't want things that are going to stand out and show everybody your mistakes. And notice I'm making sure that my machine stops with the needle down every time I stop because I have to keep advancing this. So whenever you're working on a circular circumference or something that goes around like this, make sure that you have that sewing machine set to stop with the needle down. So that buys you time. It keeps your spot. You don't lose your place. And you can work around easily. All right. And we're coming back around to the beginning. <laughs> Nina says, I stitched in the ditch my first quilt and wanted to set it on fire as a beginner. Girl, I think we've all been there. <laughs> I tried to tell all my beginners, I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. I don't know where you heard that, where you read that. Don't do it. All right. So instead of back stitching, remember, we're going to just overlap our first stitches by a few. Just go like a half an inch over, you know, that's plenty. Let's trim these threads, give this thing a press. Oh my gosh. So here you go. And you can give it a press to kind of flatten out the lining fabric parts here. But remember that the lining is already set to finish a little bit smaller. I have to really give that a press because we ate some of the fabric of that lining fabric, right? as it rolled out to give us that full binding at the top. Oh my gosh. But hello, I dare one of you to try and find where I left the opening. Look at that. I feel like we all, like when we're looking for quick projects, it's like, it's a quick project, it's easy, but it, it's usually cutting corners somewhere where you can tell. You know what I mean? That it was a quick project. But this one here, it's like, mm, there's no hand stitching. There's no hole in the lining that you have to like grab and then machine stitch and you can tell where you flipped it out through. So that's just one of my little tips that I hope you like in this project. You can give it a press, you know. This time I would probably press it like this, like from the inside with the iron here. Press it here. Press it here. I'm not going to bother with this. Why? Because it's going to get full of stuff anyways. And that is going to weigh it down. Ta-da! Isn't that cute? Oh my gosh. Love it! So yes, I hope so many of you make these, crank them out for the holidays. Remember that the product that we're using is Bozol Inner Form, and we sell it in 18 inch by 58 inch pieces or packs, and then also 36 inch by 58 inch. So if you plan on making a ton, I think it's a better value to get the bigger one because you're getting twice the width, one yard by 58 inches. And all we needed to make each one of these baskets was a 10 inch by 11 and a half inch rectangle. Two pieces like that of fabric and one of the foam. Stash Buster Central, right? Yes, I think so. Awesome, awesome. Thank y'all so much. Margie says, super cute. Hey, Margie. Great. Oh, Cindy says, yes, these are going to be great gifts for the sister-in-laws. That is awesome. Oh, and Shelly's going to make them. She says she loves them. She's going to try it in her office makeover. Great little way to organize things, right? Even if you have babies or somebody has a baby, like little baby socks and little booties and little teensy things would be super cute, little washcloths. They're great little organizers. Again, the dimensions were 10 inches by 11 and a half inches, two rectangles at those measurements of fabric and one of foam. That's all you need, okay? And then the finished dimensions of the basket themselves are this way, five inches 
by four inches by about three and a half inches tall. So good little size. And they hold a bunch. Oh my God, how cute. All right, so you can put me put them on my face now. I'm back. So if you want to purchase any of the foam stabilizer that we use to make this project, you can use the link in the chat box in the video description if you're watching us on YouTube. And you can always shop with us at craftygemini.com slash shop. Thank you everybody for joining us. I'm so glad that you enjoyed them. I see some of you are saying that you need to make them for your clips. I've made so many different types of little baskets. I mean, I have a lot of clips. It's going to hold so many. If you have hundreds of clips, I have it in a bigger basket over there, but let me... I mean, there's like a hundred clips in there and it's still not even halfway full. <laughs> so you can totally do that for your clips, your little snips, your bobbins, your thread, all that kind of stuff. So I hope that you enjoyed uh, learning how to make these super cute little fabric baskets. Remember that we carry the Bozal Interform product in two different packs and sizes in our online shop. And anytime you want, we have hundreds of products, both digital courses and physical products for sale on our website at craftygemini.com forward slash shop. All right, next week, Wednesday, there is no Whip Wednesday. That is the day before American Thanksgiving here. And my daughter and I are gonna be cooking up a storm. So I will not be here with y'all for that Wednesday, but the following Wednesday after that, we should have another scheduled Whip Wednesday. All right, thanks everybody for tuning in. Grab your inner form and I hope that you give this project a try. If you do, post pictures and you can tag me on Instagram using the hashtag Crafty Gemini so we can see all your projects. All right. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your week, everybody. Bye.